Good morning. Thanks everyone for coming. As Cole said, my name is Sarah Randall, and I am here to talk today about the um, Freeport Clam experiments. And I'm going to just sort of give a really brief overview uh, because I don't have enough time to really go into depth uh, too much, but to give an overview of the Freeport ex Clam experiments that we've been doing for the past three years. I'm the field research coordinator for the Down East Institute, and I've been doing this for the past three years. So the purpose of the field experiments were to examine the effectiveness of different methods to protect shellfish from green crabs and other predators, and how to enhance soft shell clam populations. Um, what's really important to know about the experiments is that it's applied. So we're testing different methods that people, managers can use um, to manage the resource, to protect the resource and enhance clam populations. Another thing that I really wanted to emphasize is that these are really large scale experiments. Um, hopefully you'll get sort of a sense from that from some of the pictures um, that I'm gonna show, but these are large scale. Um, and a lot of times when you hear Dr. Beal, who's the PI for this, um, you might hear him in different forums um, like this or other places where he's talking about some of the findings from some of these experiments. But he usually, when he gives his talks, he just focuses in on like one experiment or even one experiment at one site or maybe just one year. So I really want to get across to people that there are these, uh, a lot of these experiments and they're large scale and there's a lot going on and there's a lot that we've learned. And I'm also going to try to give the implications of the findings for management. So this is just a list of um, experiments that we've been doing. I just, as you can see, um, so 2014, 15, 16, each year we do about six different experiments. Um, and, and you can see that we duplicate. Um, so in 2014 we did uh, green crab trapping, we also did that the next year. We've done our ocean acidification studies every year of the experiment. Uh, we've done protective boxes for the past two years, netting all years, upwellers for two years. And then if you read more into it, you can see that we're duplicating them. Some of the experiments we're duplicating in um, other coves, um, usually two, maybe three, um, sometimes as much for two expect or for the recruitment box study, we're doing it in two and 20 different locations in the Harris River. In 2014 and 15, we did the green crab trapping um, in subtitle and intertidal sites. We looked at, uh, we weighed and measured the crabs, and we looked at crab abundance, sex ratio, diet, size, frequency, and percent of egg-bearing females. And what we found, the overview of this, um, is that we found, you know, green crabs have not gone away. They are here in high densities. Interestingly, the crabs were smaller in 2014 than in 13. But even at these small sizes, green crabs have the ability to, pr to reduce clam populations. And they increase as the water is more. Um, so throughout, when we got into the summer, um, they, uh, their numbers increased, um, especially in the intertidal areas. And then for management, what, this, what these findings uh, mean is that it does not appear to be possible to reduce crab populations locally through trapping. Therefore, managers need to adapt management methods to the high populations of human crabs and predation. In 2014, we did predator exclusionary fencing. We had 28 plots, 14 of which were um, fenced in. And I think from these pictures, you might get a sense of um, the amount of work it took to um, get them into the mud, install them in the mud, um, maintain them, and also it was a lot of work taking them out. Um, and then interestingly, we found, after we put all this work in, because um, as many of you might remember, this was a technique used by biologists in the 1950s when we had upswinging green crabs to try to stop the green crabs. So, after, but after we did this experiment, we found that um, the fencing had no more ability to reduce or deter green crabs and other predators than netting alone. We also found that mud snails were a problem. We had so many mud snails that they laid so many eggs that they impeded the nets that we had from operating correctly. For, so for the management implications for this experiment was that we don't recommend fencing for towns that are dealing with green crabs. Um, and that's especially true where it's convenient because it costs a lot to install these in these. <coughs> so in 
So in 2014, we did an experiment with claim enhancement on under nets using cultured seed. And we did find from this a high variation in the results. Um, the map shows that these sites were literally across the river from one another. Um, one site was decimated totally by um, predation. We can perhaps not be river worms. Um, and the other side was not. So the management implication for this um, is that the caution is needed when applying traditional clam enhancement techniques. And that's due to the levels of uh, predation that are higher in some areas than others. And that's the design of all the nets that were on both sides of the river. Um, another study we did in 2014 was using adult clams, again, under nets to enhance clam recruitment. That's because there's an idea that um, clams are, settling clams are attracted to adult clams. Um, we did this at two different sites, um, 30 different plots at each site lots of replicates. Um, the, our findings for this one was that there are high densities of adult clams do not encourage wild seed clam recruitment. And then the survival of the soft shell juveniles, um, they were more abundant in the netted plots versus unnetted. So again, the predator protection element. And that was regardless of whether or not the netted plots contained adult clams. So for management, this means that there's no need to transplant adults or sublegal clams if the goal is to use these animals to attract wild seed. And then in 2014 and 15 and 16, we did ocean acidification studies using sediment buffering. And this is actually one of the, or this is the set of experiments that Dr. Beal is going to be talking about um, in his next, uh, in the next presentation after me. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about this because he's going to do. Um, but our basic finding is that right now, at least, ocean acidification is not a significant source of shellfish mortality. And so that means currently there is no need to spread crushed shell on the um, surface of the intertidal plots to encourage clams to settle. 2014 and 15, we did, um, we had clamors growing clams in an upweller. Um, 2014, we had one upweller with one million clams, and the next year we doubled up and got two upwellers and two million clams. Um, so interesting findings were that these clams in the upweller grew really fast in the first couple of months. Um, but they're very high maintenance. Uh, they require a lot of cleaning. And the cleaning itself, especially with the two upwellers, would be like a full-time job. Um, and it's very difficult to actually lift the barrels. Um, you need a lot of physical strength for a um, sort of pulley system to do it. And then there's lots of following from tunicates and mussels that you have to deal with as well. So the management implication from this would be that if towns were going to consider doing an upweller um, to grow seed clams to a larger size to transplant into the mud, um, given the amount of effort that that's going to take, you know, you would, it would be wise to protect the town's investment uh, by protecting the clams when they are transplanted into the mud. In 2015 and 16, we did we looked at the growth and survival of clams and protected boxes. <coughs> and this was sort of adapted because we were finding a lot of milky ribbon worm predation. Um, so we're thinking, okay, so we got to protect that we were protecting the clams from the top from green crabs, but we need to maybe protect them from the bottom too from milky ribbon worms. So in 2015, we had six sites, 221 boxes. Uh, 200, uh, 2016, we had three sites, 135 boxes. Our findings from this is that predation is the number one threat to shellfish populations. Green crabs have not gone away. Milky ribbon worm densities are high. And these combined, these predators pose serious impediments to wild and cultured clam populations. So again, when uh, if you're looking for site selection as a town, or maybe if you're a clam farmer, you, know, you really need to look at the site decisions um, if there's an area of high predation, that's going to be a problem. And that management methods need to adapt to account for the high levels of predation. So the 2015 and 16, we did um, recruitment box studies where the clams settle, the recruiting clams settle into these boxes once they settle out of the water column. So it's a really good way to see what's actually landed there because we take samples um, at the end of the season, we take we take the boxes out of the water and take everything out of there, but we also take samples next, literally right next to the boxes. And most often in those cores, there's nothing in them, but 
right next to them, um, we see things like that. That's an example of um, the clamps that we found in one box in one area. So we can see that areas that we may think of as unproductive because there aren't any adult clams in there, they actually might be really productive. They're just getting eaten before they can reach adult sizes. So for management, this means we need we you know rethink the uh, term productive and dead mud. And that limiting the effects of predation on small clams by protecting them may be a strategy to increase clam abundance. And that these boxes can be used um, as a tool to learn about the particular production of a flat. So this um, are just some pictures of um, what sampling um, looks like for us. And I, it's a lot of effort to deploy, maintain, collect, and process all this data. Um, but it's a also a lot of data and information for shellfish managers. The significant findings so far, we tried to narrow it down into like a top 10 or 9. Um, but it does, so the, the uh, first, it does not appear to be possible to reduce green crab populations locally with trapping. Uh, green crabs can grow very fast, uh, their numbers are increasing in warming waters. A large amount of clams are settling in certain areas of the Harrisica River but these clams are not surviving to commercial sizes. That's the recruitment boxes study that I was mentioning. Um, currently, this predation, not ocean acidification, that is the most important factor for impacting clam survival. Milky ribbon worms um, are also having a major negative impact on clams populations. And I didn't mention this, but one of the interesting findings was that they tend to like wait a little bit before they eat the clams. They want the clams to be a little bit bigger. Um, Green crabs, uh, exclusionary fencing is not the best choice for predator exclusion. Flexible netting is a promising tool, um, and it will work best in areas where there are low and few ribbon worm populations. Clam boxes, the top and the bottom protection and the side, are um, a better protection, are a better method to protect uh, clams from milk ribbons and green crabs. And then mud snails are extremely prolific in Casco Bay and their egg laying on predator current netting is a problem because it reduces the effectiveness of the netting. So, in general, um, what we know is that other scientists have seen or shown that the Maine's waters are among the fastest warming in the world and they're predicted to continue to warm. Green crabs are from the Mediterranean. They thrive in these warming waters. Warming waters mean more and more predation. Green crabs are a permanent part of the marine ecosystem in Maine, so we got to adapt to their presence and impact. It's all about adaptive shellfish management. Moving forward, we'll need to expect and work around the green crab um, populations and other predators. And when we're looking at the future of the fishery, we're going to need to update and innovate commonly used shellfish management tools. For example, municipal shellfish programs will need to expand from a passive enforcement only approach to a more directed ecology based active management approach, approach. And that we should be looking at large scale clam protection projects and try to swiftly implement them. So, a lot of the more in depth um, than this general overview um, information is, can be found at the Down East Institute website. It has information from uh, all the years that the experiments have been going on. And they're going to be updated soon with the, with the results from 2016. And Dr. Beal, as I mentioned, is now going to be talking about more in depth about two of the different experiments, the sediment buffering and the recruitment boxes in the Harris Cooper Journal.